Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Highland, Archives Director of the Jewish Museum Milwaukee. And it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, a virtual book talk for Before the Invention of Smiling with author and director of such classic off the wall comedies like Airplane, The Naked Guns and Scary Movies, David Zucker. First, a few uh, technical things. I just, just ask for any patience with any technical glitches that might occur during this presentation. If you do have any technical challenges during the talk, please use the chat feature, which can be accessed by clicking the chat button at the bottom of the screen, and someone from our team will attempt to help you. If we were in the museum, this would be the point where we'd ask you to silence your cell phones, but uh, since we're virtual, we ask that you please keep your microphones muted during the presentation and to ask your questions via the chat feature for David to answer. To get the best experience possible, for this program, we're going to recommend that you view the program in speaker view. So if you're sort of seeing a Brady Bunch style type view right now, you can select the speaker view option in the top right hand corner of your screen. I know many of you have already donated to support the program today. And if you haven't donated yet and are able to, we ask that you make a donation to the museum so we continue, can continue to offer programs such as this one. We'll share the donation link in the chat box towards the end of the program. So part of the museum's mission is uh, preserving the history of Jewish people in southeastern Wisconsin. And what better way for us to do that than hearing from a Milwaukeean who made it big in Hollywood and has written a book about his family's history, including their early years in Milwaukee. Um, so in introducing our speaker, David Zucker, with a string of worldwide box office hits and the invention of an entire film genre, writer, director, producer, David Zucker has established himself as a Hollywood legend. Starting out after college in 1971 with a borrowed videotape deck and camera, David, along with his brother, Jerry, and friend, Jim Abrams, created the Kentucky Fried Theater on the UW-Madison campus. After only a year, they moved to Los Angeles, where KFT became the most successful small theater in Los Angeles history with its groundbreaking style of outrageous sketch comedy. After parlaying this success into the Kentucky Fried movie, the three conceived the idea that would create a whole new film genre. Airplane broke all conventions, featuring dramatic actors like Robert, Robert Stack and Leslie Nielsen performing zany jokes with straight-laced sincerity. The spoof became a surprise global hit and began a streak of hilarious films, including Top Secret and Ruthless People, after which David wrote all the Naked Gun movies and directed the first two Naked Gun movies in the franchise. Basketball, along with Scary Movies 3 and 4, among many others. Outside of the entertainment world, David has cultivated a keen interest in history, co-writing a screenplay on the life of Davy Crockett, and hosting a series of gatherings at his Ojai, California ranch, attracting historians, artists, mm -hmm. educators, craftspeople, and also flintlock rifle enthusiasts. This historical fascination led him to finish his decades long research into his own family history, resulting in Before the Invention of Smiling, adding yet another title to his list of groundbreaking creations. So please welcome David Zucker. Hi. <laughs> and David, I'd like if you could uh, start off, please, just by um, talking a little bit about what um, inspired you to write this book and the process, um, the whole process behind it, because I know it's a really involved process that covers many years. Well, it, yes, it was a involved process and, and it, it, it did take, you know, 60 years, I suppose. I, I grew up listening uh, in Milwaukee. We lived in Shorewood. And I listened, I would listen to my grandmother tell these stories about how she grew up in a little village called Hinkovitz, which was in, then it was in Hungary, uh, Austria, Hungary to be specific. <clears throat> and uh, the, and uh, she was uh, one of eight brothers and sisters. She was born in uh, 1893. And uh, she was one of eight brothers and sisters, and she was the only one who ever talked about it. And so 
And I was the only one of her 10 grandkids who really listened and was interested. I'm not sure why I have an interest in history. Uh, it may have just happened naturally, but I do remember being fascinated when I saw the, you know, the Walt Disney um, Davy Crockett uh, show in the, in the middle uh, 1950s. And I was fascinated with that. And I wanted to immediately know, where, you know, where is the Alamo right now? And where is, where is Davy Crockett's original home, where, you know, where he grew up in Tennessee? So I had this interest in, in history and, and I would hear my grandmother tell these stories over and over. And then, um, it sometime much later in this was in 1976 and Jerry my brother and I were already in Los Angeles uh, operating our little theater it was a, a sketch comedy theater called Kentucky Fried Theater and we um, and, and we we we, came, we went back for a visit to Milwaukee and uh, and we sat down and actually got the I had the idea to get this story on recorded on, on a cassette tape and that's what we did and that sat in a drawer for you know about another 20 years until I I pulled it out I thought well I should get a transcript made and I did that and so I was reading the transcript it's a whole different experience reading a transcript and then uh and I in her own voice it was fascinating so and that's and that's when it I, the first version of the book was a children's book told in the third person, but I wasn't satisfied with that um, because it ended when they arrived in uh, Milwaukee at the old Chicago Northwestern Depot, and but it wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't a satisfying ending, and so I put it away for another ten years, and uh, <clears throat> and then I, I I read the transcript again and I thought, well I should just tell it in the in the first person and let let grandma tell the story and so that's what i did and so that's the first two chapters is grandma's uh narrative and then the third chapter is about my dad and the fourth chapter is about me and the uh the final chapter which is one page is my kids so it just shows kind of the generations and i have i've got every family picture uh, and I put, I mean, I put the important ones in and I explained it. And there's, there, as you know, there's, there's a lot of humor in the book. I, I try not to take things too seriously. So David, this is Ellie Gettinger. I'm the education director at the museum and I'm delighted to be in conversation with you today. Um, what were the kind of hallmarks of your grandmother's story? What were the things that intrigued you about hearing about this town in the Austro-Hungarian empire growing up in Shorewood? What felt different? Well, um, there were perhaps when I was, you know, seven or eight when I first started uh, ingesting these stories. Uh, maybe the adventure of it um, appealed to me, and those those kinds of adventures were, you know, she was when she was probably under the age of two or age one. There was a flood there and uh and uh and her she was saved by her uncle and her mother and they 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 went to a church that was uh uh that was on higher ground and i you know heard all these stories and then my grandmother said that there was a man who was you know one of the the people who escaped from the flood that said and and my grandmother was not breathing i guess and so she was only one year old. And so uh, obviously my great grandmother was, you know, getting hysterical. And so the guy the, and and my grandmother told me that the guy said, what do you care? You've got uh, you've got six other kids. You know, what do you, what do you care? And, uh, and she, you know, that was pretty crass. So uh, so my gr great grandmother started breastfeeding my grandmother and she came back to life and you know so there there was a pretty and pretty uh exciting story and so you can imagine me hearing this stuff and so for the book uh obviously there's no pictures available so i had an artist one of the uh one of the people who did the storyboards for the movies for the naked guns gary thomas and uh and cynthia angulo 
uh, actually did uh, artist drawings. So that's that's kind of a unique uh, facet of the book that that you know that there's there's drawings as well as the photograph. You created the environment that your grandmother that you imagine your grandmother was in. Right, right. and I, I like to have the visual. I want to see it, and so. And then the other thing that happened is that they had to escape from uh, Hungary. They had to escape into over the border and into Poland. Why? Because if they if they just went over the border, um, they could cross the border, but they would take all their money. So they hid the money, and they went over. And they, they my my grandmother's younger brother and sister, who were probably eight and nine at the time went in a in an onion wagon and all stuff so i mean my grandma is telling me all this that's pretty cool stuff and so i of course you know had the had the drawings made they're crossing the border at night and it's and it's very exciting and then going on the train where she said there were thieves all all you know they had to really one of them had to stay up all the time and then getting to uh the port which would my grandmother thought was rotterdam but i found out from the ellis islands records that it was Bremen, Germany. I found out what ship it was. I found their names in the Ellis Island records. And so, which gave me the date. So it's it was fascinating for me to do this research, which probably could not have been done, you know, before the uh, the internet uh, really made it, made it easy. So in that kind of research, when did your grandmother and her family come here? And was it everybody all at once or had, someone come first and then well send yeah that's a good question the um they started coming in about 1904 05 because my grandmother said the russians were uh were drafting but i don't know how they drafted people she may have gotten that a little mixed up because they were in well, they drafted boys they drafted 13 and 14 year old boys into the russian army that would be and a lot of people especially were sending their their 12, 13, 15 year old sons away. Right, and my grandmother said they, they, couldn't, they couldn't send the, the, her two older brothers uh, in because they'd have to eat treif and that, that was absolutely uh, forbidden. So uh, that's when they started leaving in about uh, 05. And so um, my, the oldest brother, Uncle Phil left and I have all the records for, for when, when they all came over. And then the next one was uh, Uncle Sam and and Frida and Fanny and all the kids left until there were just just my grandmother was left and this is in 1909 and in uh, it was my grandmother her mother the father had all, all, all also left uh, probably a month some months before and you know there's all these questions that I want to ask that. You know, uh, I mean, I asked more questions than most people and I got the information, but there's still many questions I feel like I could have asked my grandmother. <clears throat> like, when did, when did, when was the date of her, her grandmother's death? I don't know, but I just, I kind of assume it was probably in the early 1900s. But uh, they, so, so they all, so my great grandfather left before and I was wondering if there was some kind of, uh, conflict there between the parents um, because he left before and my my grandmother's mother refused to leave because she gave all these excuses she had to say the prayers at the graves every year uh, in America they eat treif uh, uh, my she was afraid uh, grandma would not shave her head when she got married and so grandma promised to do all these things and still her and grandma, she was 16 at the time. She desperately wanted to leave. She wanted to get out of there and out of this little, you know, you know, one horse town and, and get to America where, you know, all these great stories. And, and my uncle Sam or uncle Phil would send letters back. And the letters were kind of realistic, Frank, the, you know, the winters were cold and it was, it was a struggle. They were trying to get a grocery store established, but grandma would embellish the stories when she read it to her mom because her mother was was not able to read. So that's a little bit of the early <laughs> Zucker uh, yeah. 
dramatic uh, license there. I, I, well, no, and I see that penchant for the drama, penchant for the, hey, story is important here. Um, well, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a, you know, the kind and my great grandmother was probably 55 and grandma was 16. And it was a real conflict between mother and daughter. And so finally, uh, and this, I got these stories from different people in my family. So my dad's younger brother, my uncle Bob, told me that grandma uh, finally went to see the rabbi in, in mm -hmm. Stropkov. And I looked that up. Thank God for the internet. It's had, all, I found the actual name of the rabbi and I got his picture. It was wonderful. And so she went, she went to this place and she asked the rabbi, what, what should I do? And my, my uncle Bob said, are you willing to tell a little white lie? This is the rabbi says, and grandma says, okay. And, and the rabbi says, tell your mother that your beshert is waiting for you in Milwaukee. And she told that, I, I, I heard that one from my uncle, my, my grandmother, in my grandmother's version, she said, if I stay here in Hinkovitz, I'll just marry one of the local boys. She's gonna marry a Gentile. And I think that was enough for her mother to relent. So uh, her mother did relent and this is all, yes. Did her mother uh, immigrate with her or her yes, mother? Yes, yes, so they went, yeah, no, her mother went with her and she and her mother walked, you know, uh, like 16, 17 miles all through the night uh, over the border. And I imagine there was some kind of road or path that wasn't the official border crossing. And so they avoided that. Uh, and then and then also in the book I tell her, and, and grandma says in her narrative that she learned to like America. And then <clears throat> and then at her wedding, uh, she she's so I asked my ice grandma, so did you have to shave your head? And uh, grandma said, no, no, the, uh, your mother said, it's okay, you, you, she got it, it's America, we don't have to do that. And so, of course, they became reform. <clears throat> and, and, and one of the, thing, one of the things that um, my great grandmother was concerned about was that, you know, would her, will my great grandchildren be Jewish? So, and, and grandma assured them assured her mother Rivka that they would. Um, now, of course, today the jury's still out. We don't, we don't know what's gonna happen to our, you know, <clears throat> out of the 10 grandkids, I don't know, I think, I think most of them have gotten bar and bat mitzvah, but we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens. What brought the family to Milwaukee? You know, it's not, it's not the Lower East Side of New York. It's no. not, you know, uh, no. Maxwell Street in Chicago. Yeah. What, what was the attraction to Milwaukee specifically? It was, uh, other family had been there. My, my great grandmother, and she was the doctor in the village, but really the midwife. My grandmother always said she was the doctor. Very, very popular. My grandmother, you know, was the famous one in this village. And <clears throat> she was a Stern. And the Stern family is the one, the family who came to Kenosha first and then Milwaukee. So they kind of followed the Stern family to Wisconsin and, uh, and, and, and the, the, the larger family all did end up in Milwaukee. And I think, uh, yeah, downtown and on the South side, I think my grandfather, Leo, uh, was, lived on the South side. And that, that's not a typical Jewish enclave at the turn of the 20th century. There is some Jewish settlement there, but it's not a huge part yeah, of that. They were on something in Burnham. Oh. And, I, um, and I found the house. It's still, it's still there. And, uh, and I, I, I went there and knocked on the door and, and looked inside. And I, but I didn't, what happened, what I found out later from my cousin Debbie is that the family lived upstairs and there was a, a store. He, I think the, the father was a tailor and he had his store downstairs, of course. And there's a picture of the family sitting at a, 
looks like a dining room, big dining room table. It was possibly a holiday. And there was a distinctive window in the background with, uh, with a lot of uh, wood molding. And so I tried to find that, but I couldn't, I couldn't locate that. But I want to find the exact spots. It's like, so I went with my storyboard artist, uh, with Gary Thomas, who did the original drawings. And we actually went to Hinkovitz, hired a guide in Krakow. And we found the exact location, which my grandmother said uh, was right where the river crossed the road. And, and she drew a map. And so I took that map with me. And, and that's, of course, in the book. And another, uh, another relative of my grandmother had been back. And he said it was all destroyed in the war, in World War I. There was, uh, World War II, there was a huge battle there. It was called the, the Battle of Dukla Pass between uh, the retreating Germans and the Russians. And, uh, and so he said there was nothing left of your house. But I went there, I found there were houses there, but, and I, I kind of thought that they were built on the original foundations. And grandma did describe there was a barn in the back, which was closer to the river and sure enough there was. So it, it was exactly as grandma described. That's amazing. And it's amazing that it's still there. Yeah, that it's still, I mean, that the place I was able to find, the place, there's no addresses, but it was on, right. you know. And the fact that her map could be that good. <laughs> yeah, and I and that, that map is, is in the book, the original. That's the wonderful. The map, yeah. How did acculturation happen for your grandma? She had all of these huge expectations and hopes. And yes, you know, she didn't shave her head when she got married and she, that uh, their Judaism changed um, a yeah. bit in the United States. Was she comfortable here? Did she, did she? Oh, totally. My grandma was, you know, more than anything, my grandmother was the transition between what had come, what had been basically the same thousands and thousands of years. So my grandmother is born. She's 16. She is pre-reform. She is just, she can't wait to be, you know, free of the whole orthodox thing. So, um, I mean, we didn't talk specifically about that, but then I think back and that's, that's what happened with our family. They, I think they were in some kind of orthodox con congregation initially where, uh, and, and they were married at a, in 1915 at a, at a congregation that was orthodox and uh, the building is no longer there. It was a, it was a church that it had been built by Polish immigrants or something, so, but it was a it was a, a Presbyterian church at which the Jewish, the Orthodox congregation took over. <clears throat> and so that's where she, she was married. And so I, I, of course, on the internet, I found pictures of it actually where they were married. And then I, I had the drawing made where, you know, there she's in her wedding dress, which there are pictures of. And so, it's in front of the country. So it's all, it's all based on what really happened and authentic stuff. How does that generational transfer, you know, I think a lot of times that your mom came here and had that experience of both being kind of <laughs> first generation immigrant and a child of immigrants at the same time, which meant that your father was also in this kind of interesting position. Yeah, my um, mother and my father were both born in America. My mother on the Lower East Side of New York. She met my dad at the University of Wisconsin. Oh. And my dad, you know, born in, uh, you know, in Milwaukee in 1916. And, um, you know, and he grew up reform and they, they had a beautiful home in Shorewood. And, uh, well, they had many homes. Finally, in 1936, they built the you know, the home that, that I grew up in, essentially. We, we, we had a home in Whitefish Bay and then we, we moved in to, our, uh, to the Wildwood house uh, in 1956. And uh, so, but, you know, it helped to give me a perspective of where I came from. I mean, I became a Hollywood movie director. It's, it's ludicrous. Almost, it's crazy what happened to our family. And I, I mean, I feel like the subtitle could be from Hinkovich to Hollywood. Well, that was the, one of the titles at, at, before. Um, 
and it, it may have been a good title, but um, it, it's it struck me that uh, you know the, all these all these old pictures, nobody's smiling, and so and yes. Yeah, so that, tell me about the the title of the book. It's the invention of smiling. What? Yeah, well, because uh, I put captions, and I tried to. A lot of them are humorous, as as you as you know. So uh, there was a picture of my great grandfather and my grandfather at my grandfather's. Uh, bar mitzvah probably and this was it was probably taken in europe back in russia and they're just you know they're just stone-faced and um and i i captioned it before the invention of smiling and uh and then i took a picture of myself and <clears throat> there was a picture of myself and joe weinshell who's great whose grandfather was a partner is with my grandfather in the pants business, Zucker and Weinschel. And incredibly, I found an old card. I mean, we the stuff that I found was amazing. And, you know, what can you do with that stuff? And it would be either thrown away or lost if, if I didn't, you know, think up to, to, to put it in the book. But, um, and, and so, and Joe and I are smiling. And I met Joe, you know, when we were both eight years old at uh, Camp Minicani. In, in Milwaukee. And I didn't really know the connection, but it's the mom and dad said, yeah, Weinschels are a, they're either relatives or, you know, close to the family. So, and then, and then I put uh, the caption of, and of course, Joe and I are smiling. And I said, after the invention of smiling. So, and then I, I really like that concept. So I decided to, to name the book that instead of making it, you know, too much about me. I mean, it's a lot about me, anyways. So, I mean, it's a it's a memoir slash family memoir, so it's fair. You're you're allowed yeah, that <laughs> family memoir. And I'm in fact, I'm I'm writing a book now. Uh, there's another book. Uh, it's going to be a trilogy, and the book <laughs> I'm writing now is called uh, "Surely You Can't Be Serious." And it's you know. The, I wonder the, where that title comes from. Uh, the yeah, <laughs> the true story of airplane, and as you know, of course, it's one of the lines in airplane, but. Um, and that's about the, the 10 years, you know, between 1970 and 1980 that we, that we did Airplane. We, you know, we, we you And know, really what, changed the face of comedy. And I, yeah, and it's like, and I love, you know, the history of it, of course, me. And, uh, and so I wanted to tell, I tell the story and there's a million pictures uh, that all, and I, cause I saved everything. I, I'm, the, I'm the official historian of, Z-A-Z, -Z. so of course I saved it. And that, this is a fun book. To, to um, we definitely want you to have, we want you to come back to talk about that one too. No, this um, is the only one you get. About Forget. this one, yeah. what, just, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course I will, I'll come back, yes. And thinking about this one, I think one of the things that comes through just in talking to you and, and looking at it and reading and seeing the pictures is the power of archives. And just in hearing about the accessibility of archives in, you know, if you were researching this book 15, 20 years ago, you would have had to go on so many more journeys in order to find these sorts of objects. What were the kind of best, you know, were, were there just moments that you were like, I'm just amazed that the universe can come together in this way and that I can well, find? You know, I think discovering, <clears throat> being able to, that there were Ellis Island records. <clears throat> I have a picture of the ship that they, <clears throat> that they came over in and they got the name. I got the dates. I got the picture of the, the rabbi in Stropkov. And sure enough, he's, you know, the classic bearded rabbi. And for years, uh, right over in the Wildwood house, over the fireplace mantle, there was this picture of three rabbis around a table, you know, studying Torah. And that was my grandmother's main picture. And then, I mean, it was only years and years later that I put it together that this was her memory of those rabbis of her time and probably uh, that that rabbi uh, uh, in Stropkov. And so I actually used the picture and cut out the picture of one of the rabbis and put my grandmother in instead. So she look, looks like she's talking. And that, that's in the book. You show the, it shows the, how, we, how I did it. And uh, and that picture is at my uh, Aunt Isi's house in Milwaukee. She lives in uh, Fox Point. 
in thinking about you have this huge family in Milwaukee, many different, uh, you know, what was growing up in Milwaukee in the 1950s and 60s? What did that look like? What was, what were the kind of Jewish haunts that you had? How did it work to have this kind of giant family where everybody kind of knows who you are and they, um, were there things that were positives? What were the negatives? Uh, well, I, I can't think of anything negative about it. It was just, it was wonderful growing up in Milwaukee. And I think in our, in our book, you know, Surely You Can't Be Serious, I think we give a lot of credit to, because we, you know, we grew up in Milwaukee and, and it's, you know, um, you know, part of airplane is, you know, these guys, Robert Stack and Leslie Nielsen and, and Graves and Bridges were laughing at themselves. And I think in Milwaukee, you know, you're not hot stuff because, you know, there's LA is cool in New York and even Chicago and Milwaukee is, you know, we knew we weren't the coolest guys in the planet. And, but and we got all, nothing came from Milwaukee. It was, uh, it, it was all these shows like Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver and Gunsmoke and Vanel. everything came to Milwaukee. And so I think we wanted to throw it back and because it, everything was overly serious. And due to our upbringing in Milwaukee, we just, we didn't take ourselves seriously. It's just, I think there's something in the water. And, and also in the Zucker family, I think there was a, you know, that was a major theme. And I, I put a picture, I have a picture in the book of myself as a four-year-old, uh, I'm standing in a chair in between my, my father and my grandfather. And it's the only picture of the three of us together. And dad and I are wearing bow ties. I'm sure mine was a clip-on. And my grandfather, uh, to match us in for the picture, uh, fashioned, he tied his necktie into a bow tie and it looks ridiculous, but yet he's not smiling. He's just, he's completely straight faced. And so uh, looking back on it, I mean, it's, and I didn't know what was going on. It's, I guess I thought it was funny. I'm trying to remember back, but uh, you know, that was early Leslie Nielsen right there. He was just saying funny things with a straight face. And, and would you describe like how humor kind of was injected into your upbringing? Uh, as, like, I love that idea of this picture with the, you know, the serious yeah. man. The funny it was, he, yes, it was my dad. I remember what he didn't, he couldn't tell a joke to save his life. He never told a joke, but he always said funny things, but always with a straight face. He never, you know, he would never, you know, if you, if you cut to, today, 2021, he would never say something in an email and say, LOL. You know, he said, either you got the joke or you didn't. And I, I do the same thing. I, I just, I won't put a smiley face on anything. Either person gets the joke or they don't. And sometimes they don't. So, you know, I have to explain it, but I still won't, you know, I won't go yet. You know, I, I, I won't put any uh, sugar on it. I, and I think that's one of the things that comes up in your movies is the number of jokes per minute that right. you're not entirely sure of your weight. By the time you've gotten through joke number one, joke number seven is already out there. So you're like, wait, do I need to. So it's great for home watching because you can pause and go you back. Can pause it. Right. And in the theater, you know, we did a live theater for many years, for five years before we did Kentucky Fried Movie. And uh, we were on stage and we, we never wanted to be on stage when people weren't laughing. So that's where the pace came from. We didn't, you know, it was, it was not calculated. Okay, we're gonna do three jokes to a page. I mean, that's how it eventually worked out. But this was, uh, this was just because we found it was easier to keep an audience laughing uh, than to start them up all over again. Um, I read a beautiful oral history of Kentucky Fried Theater from UW-Madison's Alumni Magazine. And they describe the process of building the theater and that it, basically there is nothing that you guys didn't do to get this theater, the, the kind of construction around. And none of you really had construction experience, but you all had connections. Um, can you kind of, you know, what, were, what was that moment like of being like, well, maybe we can try this out and we're gonna build a theater and, you know, it's very much like that Busby Berkeley musical 
Yeah, let's do a show. Let's do a show. Well, it, 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 it did evolve. Uh, I, I did some student films in, when I was uh, in Madison and, and most of them were uh, starring Jerry Zucker. And, uh, and Jim had already, he was already out of school so, because he was, he, Jim is four years older than I am. So he was working in Milwaukee. And so I graduated from uh, UW in film communications, you know, radio, television, film. And, you know, that, uh, that doesn't get you a job. And I, and Jerry and I talked about, we could maybe start a theater or something, but we, we, we didn't have a way to go about it. And my dad, uh, and I went to apply for jobs. I couldn't get a job anywhere. And my dad offered me a job working for him in, he was building uh, commercial office buildings at the time. So I was his construction supervisor. And during that time, I think he saw how kind of, you know, bored and unhappy I was. I really wanted to be doing entertainment. And so he said, you know, my friend Bill Kesselman uh, has some videotape equipment you could borrow. And I said, well, what would I do with that? That's, I wanna do films. And like, I didn't, I didn't think, but then, I went down to Chicago for a weekend to visit some friends and uh, they suggested that we go to a, a show called Groove Tube, uh, Void Where Prohibited by Law, which was a room that had a, it was a video show and it played an hour of video jokes, just sketch humor, but on video and you paid your money. And this was the, I had an epiphany. I said, okay, this is what we can do. We can borrow this videotape equipment and, and do so. I. I didn't even drive back to Milwaukee. I drove straight to Madison and I was like, you know, pounding on Jerry's door and jumping up and down, frothing at the mouth. I said, this is it. We're going to start a theater. We're going to do this, you know? And so that's, that's what happened. And then we recruited Jim Abrams and Dick Chudnow, uh, who was also, uh, who also had graduated from Shorewood and was Jim and Dick had an improv group. He was insanely funny and talented. And uh, so we just, and Dick wanted to combine a live sketch show with the video show. And that really hadn't occurred to us. Uh, so we did that and that we, then we, we found the back of the books of a bookstore, Shakespeare and Company. I mean, the building is still there. It's a, it's a bar now, uh, the Big Ten pub or something on Regent Street. And it was a 70 seat theater. We ran the show, it was very successful, did it for a year and then we, Loaded up a U-Haul truck and uh, and moved out to uh, to L.A. Just start, you know, got a bigger theater there. Is it apocryphal or uh, true? I heard that Lorne Michaels saw your show and was inspired. That's true. Yes, well, and I I never talked to Lorne Michaels about this. I read it in the book. This was in the book about um, uh, Saturday Night Live that um, Lorne wanted to do a show and but he didn't know what kind of show he wanted to do. He knew he wanted to do a comedy show. Uh, and so he took Dick Ebersol to see uh, Kentucky Fried Theater. And this was in 1975. And uh, he said, uh, and in, in, this, in the book, it said, Dick Ebersol said he never laughed so hard in his life. And then, and then, and Lorne Michaels said, this is what I want to do on national TV. And so, they, and I remember, I kind of have a, a vague memory of them being there and that these were big time TV guys from New York. And I think we were hoping that we would get hired as writers or something. And so we can be like, but they didn't, they didn't want us. They just wanted the idea, which, <clears throat> which is fine. I think they did a, obviously, uh, Lauren Michaels, <clears throat> excuse me, is brilliant. And he was, he was great at executing the idea we had gone a year before that, we went to, we had an I, the same idea. Let's do a, a national variety show uh, called Kentucky Fried Theater. And uh, we, we took it to our agent and the agent said, no, that'll never work. <laughs> so, that's, Little did he know. Yeah, I know the, 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 you know, yeah, I could give some advice saying, don't listen to agents. So. <laughs> Maybe that's the third book. Right, yeah, that's right. Well, no, that will be, the third book will be uh, it's really about my life, and uh, it's going to be called, it's pronounced Zucker, not Zucker. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, in thinking about kind of the ways your family, like, you know, your father, even in this moment of 
doing the kind of typical Jewish father thing of saying, yeah, come work in the family business is also at the same time saying, yeah, but I see you're not creatively um, inspired here. What can we do to help, you know, is already trying to help you find that exit strategy. Um, do you feel like you had a lot of family support as you guys were starting this crazy, really unknown in Denver? It's not like people had done sketch comedy theater at this point and created theater, com you know, this was not something that everybody was doing. Yeah. How did that work? Well, we were tremendously fortunate in that, I know my brother and I were, that we had these particular parents who were completely encouraging and my mom, was an actress and she was in drama. And she she thought, she was, of course, she thought it was great. And uh, and my dad, I think, had dreams of uh, having me work for him, but he saw that uh, I was, you know, inspired by doing movies and entertainment or whatever, you know, I, he could see that and, and he, he totally understood. And then at a certain point, I told my dad, I'm, I want to leave the business and move up to Madison full time to do this show in Madison. And he said, um, you know, that's, I think that's fine because, and he said, when you're 21, you're as smart as you're ever going to be. Uh, and so you might as well try it. Now is the time to try it. And I suppose he meant, you know, not to have regrets later, but um, they were completely encouraging. It's like, it was so amazing. And so, and uh, when we finally left for California in the, uh, cause you know, going to Madison was not any big tearful goodbye, but um, we, we, we loaded up the U-Haul truck. We're moving to California and <clears throat> we drive away and, and mom and dad are in the driveway waving goodbye. And they later told me, that you know, mom had tears in her eyes, and uh, but dad comforted her by saying, "Don't worry, they'll be back in six months." Because, you know, it just you just you know, uh, I never dreamed of being a movie director. I never thought it was possible. You know, in high school, I thought you know I wanted to do funny television commercials. I thought I knew I could do that, but you know what happens is, and what I've learned is that you know these things happen. Uh, a month at a time, a year at a time, you get to one hill, you can see the next hill. So when we were able to do a, uh, uh, you know, the, the theater, then we saw we could do TV. And then when we did TV, we could say, well, you know, and always uh, with an eye to what was out there currently. The movies were Mel Brooks and Woody Allen, and they're brilliant, but we thought we could do it. We just, we just knew we could do it. So because of course this is a Milwaukee thing, you know, it's small Milwaukee, we call it sometimes. Um, and so one of our participants um, who is J.M. Kaiser is saying, my son, Eddie Kaiser and Danny Zucker were good friends growing up and are still connection in connection today. And our family was good friends with Dorothy and Donald and we had tremendous times together. So I just want to, you know, of course you've got a lot of hometowners. I believe Eve Jones Zucker is on the call who um, oh. your aunt. Oh, uh, they're, right. they're, so, you know, all these people who are here. Well, I've collected, I've collected a lot of family heirlooms and one, one I, uh, among the items are, you know, the two candlesticks that my grandmother brought over from uh, Hungary. It's one of two items that were, was brought over. And the other item is a, a trunk, which, uh, my, uh, with, which my aunt Eve Joan gave to me and it's in my living room right now it's in the book because and then so i have this trunk and i put it in the book and i have them loading it onto the wagon so it's like i love having you know the these objects uh and so you know and we'll we'll pass them on to to the kids or and how big is the trunk can you kind of give us the dimensions uh, is uh, it let's see uh, i'm going off the uh it's about not not tremendously uh big but it's uh it's about uh four feet long by two feet high well, a bigger feet trunk high. like someone could carry it but it would be heavy well it has two handles on either one handle is gone but the other leather handle is still there wow and uh 
Eve Joan restored it. And uh, I think it was, I think it was originally black and she made it green. So I can't remember in the book if I, if I made it green or black, <laughs> but you know, there's a saying, you know, when you're, when you have a choice between uh, printing the facts or the legend, print the legend. So uh, uh, I, I, I may have made it green, in the, but in any case, I thought it looked better green. In the world of museums, what you're talking about, this idea of material culture and, and how objects tell stories and how objects become this kind of real connector, right. like that's what we do. So I feel that there's tremendous power in, in those candlesticks, in that trunk and feeling that, that family history that's just coursing through it and knowing, wait, this came from Hungary. And who knows how many generations before of, of people, of women lit those candles on Friday night and then yeah. they're now. I also they, I also depict them lighting using those candlesticks on the Friday night that they had to stay over in Krakow, and uh, you know great grandmother wouldn't leave. This is what mm -hmm. grandma said she wouldn't leave because she doesn't travel on the Sabbath, and grandma was worried that they'd miss the the train. You know, so they had to take a wagon. No, they took they no, they took the train from from Krakow. And then the other thing I've done, I have. I have objects that were in pictures that it, with my uh, grandmother and grandfather and my dad and my mom and Uncle Jim and Uncle Bob. And there was a an old table with a lamp on it and a mortar and pestle and that's in the picture. And so I, I thought that anything that's in a picture has extra value. And so I have that picture up in my upstairs uh, hallway, and uh, it's it's it, with with the picture of the family, and then the picture of that table with the lamp on it. And I had had to have some things restored. The lamp didn't have a shade. I mean, it had the frame of the shade, but I had I had the the material put in. So, and there's other things that I that I collect. What do you think the legacy of your grandmother is? And in, in thinking about this book and all the work that you've done to put it together, what are the, what are the things you take away? Well, I think she was a very strong woman. She was the matriarch. I mean, she was the straw that, stir, that stirred the drink of her eight brothers and sisters. I mean, and I don't know if everybody in the family appreciated it. I mean, I think there was some tension because grandma was a, a pretty strong character and uh, it had to be done a certain way. I mean, I think she had a great sense of humor. I loved hearing her talk about it. I don't know if other people in the family were that interested in hearing those stories, but, but I was. And, um, and certain of my cousins um, and everybody, all the, almost all the cousins are, well, half the cousins are represented in, uh, you know, telling various stories that they heard from grandma. Um, but I think, <clears throat> you know, grandma had a leg, <clears throat> just a really strong, <clears throat> strong Jewish presence. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I think she really held the family together. And we were, were a very close family when everybody was in Milwaukee. There's, you know, there's nothing out here that that is equivalent to that. I mean, we'd have we'd have every Passover, every Hanukkah. Um, we have we have the entire family. All you know, my dad, his two brothers, their whole their, all their families, <clears throat> and uh, my first cousins and me were as close as <clears throat> as most families. You know, brothers and sisters. And your brother and you embarked on an actual career together, which I think is the business. <laughs> yeah, about family closeness. Yeah, that that doesn't always work out that great, but it did. It did for us. You know, we were, uh, you know, we were uh, partners for uh, ten years in the business, and then of course, you know, these things last about ten years, and then people want to. It's like a rock band. You know, you kind of go off on your own, and that's what we did. But. Jim and Jerry and I have, have remained close. 
And I think that that's amazing. I just, in thinking about those Passover seders and those uh, Hanukkah dinners, how many people would be in the room if there were eight siblings and many, I'm guessing they had siblings, like how many people would be at a, uh, and her, her maiden name was Serlo, right? Yeah, her maiden, maiden name was Serlo. And there were, um, you know, the, <laughs> There were the three brothers, Bert, Bob, and Jim. Their wives, um, the um, uh, Eve Jones' parents would be there, the Peels, uh, E.C.'s parents, the Bercy's would be there, uh, my grandmother, and that was, and Aunt B and Uncle Maury. And then in each family, there were, um, there were, there were three kids to a family, except for uh, Eve Jones' family had four. And, uh, and so the, I don't know if it, I, I can, I'm not good at math, but uh, that's a big room. <laughs> yeah, that, it was, oh yeah, we would, my, my mom would clear out the living room and uh, there'd be a long table there for Passover. And then we, we'd all be around and my dad would conduct the Seder. That's amazing. And then uh, later, later years when my dad wasn't so, he was kind of declining. So they were at uh, Eve Jones house. One of our uh, uh, participants, Donna Neubauer, says that she thinks that that closeness was common in Milwaukee, um, and that and and now everyone's you know that because huge families all stayed in one place that you would have these intergenerational big celebrations all together that that full room, and now it's a lot harder because people have spread out. You know, you get right. a little diaspora. Yeah, I. You know, I miss that. I mean, this is what I came from. And like, you know, we, we really looked forward to Passover. And now our Passover seders are <clears throat> much smaller, often, sometimes just with my own immediate family. Um, so so it's, not, it's not the same, but it's <clears throat> not, not, not to eliminate the possibility of that happening again with, with our, our kids, I suppose. It may happen. But Milwaukee will never happen. I mean, it was so amazing growing up in Milwaukee. I really, uh, I, I just, I, I couldn't have had a better uh, time. And not only because of the Milwaukee Braves and the Green Bay Packers. It was like we had wonderful sports teams. <laughs> it was great. And everything was amplified by, it was just, uh, you know, a relatively small city. So it was... Um, you know, my brother said, you know, when, when Jim and Jerry and I were writing the book about the, uh, the, the ZAZ story, he said, you know, uh, when something, if you live in New York and something comes on the TV about New York, nobody calls, hey, look, there, there's something about New York. <clears throat> it just, it's just a different feel. But I've had, the, I've had the great fortune to live in both places. <clears throat> And, you know, starting out in Milwaukee and then we go to Hollywood and it was, uh, I think a lot of our success in Hollywood was because we, we were totally different from anything that was in, that was in LA, certainly. I mean, we just kind of, we brought Milwaukee with us. And then when Airplane premiered, uh, mom and dad and, uh, and Jim Abrams' mom invited 600 people to the Fox Bay Theater and we had the premiere and that was like, that was like the high point of my life. It was like, it was wonderful. That's like the ultimate bar mitzvah party. Yeah, right. No, everybody that I ever knew was there and we did a Q and A afterwards. Uh, I wish more pictures had been taken, but the, you know, this is before the invention of cell phones. Oh, and Linda Frank is saying that she loved the Milwaukee premieres and the talkbacks that you guys did afterwards. Oh, good. I'm glad. Um, so. Yeah, no, now you would have five, thousand <clears throat> everyone would have taken a selfie well, linda and... did you get any pictures see what good are you if you linda didn't... did you get any pictures new no. no yeah i mean there's a few pictures so i don't know for the book we've hit we had to recreate like the outside of the theater we had to recreate it with putting in a crowd outside of the theater mm -hmm. so i'm not telling anyone just this this audience well we'll keep that under wrap <clears throat> yes I want to thank you so much for joining us, for taking time out to talk about this. Um, the book is available on Amazon. Yes. Um, and uh, but you have to try to try to get it on a some app or 
It's for a Kindle, yeah. It's an e in color, it's got to be. It's, you need to see it in color. And and as we now know, you've totally wet our appetite for all of the fabulous pictures and recreations that uh, you made for this book. So everyone, make sure you find the color edition on Amazon. Um, it has been so much fun to hear about your family, to hear about your journey, and to to just hear about the kind of backstory in Hollywood. Um, Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I think it's my, I guess I'm the wrap up person, Jay, or do you want to wrap it up? But I, I want to quick thank Jay yes. for, Jay was a tremendous uh, resource for the book. And <clears throat> I do acknowledge in the book that he, and Jay, Jay's pictures in the book, and he was very helpful with, uh, uh, for me to find addresses of past homes. And I was able to, because all the addresses changed. So mm -hmm. I want to thank him here. And that's one of the things, that's one of the ways in which we got connected here. And one of the things you guys should realize is not only are we a fabulous museum, we also have a fabulous archives staffed by the very best, Mr. Jay Highland. He's awesome, he's helpful, and he does a lot of really amazing work that I'm so glad that you, thank you for, for, for tooting Jay's horn because he will never do it himself. Um, <laughs> And thank you, um, Ellie. This is this is great. I love. Oh, um, my yeah. pleasure. Um, my colleague uh, Cassie just put the link to the book in the uh, in the chat, so you guys can find it there. Um, it's not, so it's only on e-readers for the person who's asking how about Boswell. Donna, I'm glad you loved the conversation. And we have one more comment. It was I actually remember Grandma Sarah Zucker, who was a friend of my grandma Lee Zucker, um, Zuckert with a T. Uh, and that's also from Linda. They were old friends. And I think that's one of the things about being a newcomer to Milwaukee is just discovering all of these old connections is so See, awesome. The, the Zuckerts, I, you know, I knew that nothing was ever good enough for them. They had to add a T, you know? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that extraneous T. Yeah, yeah. Um, our next program is uh, coming up on, I believe, July uh, 16th. And Cassie's going to throw it in there, or she can just check out the other the upcoming mm -hmm. program since I don't have the script in front of me. Um, the The next program is actually exploring all of the diverse programs of the New Deal with uh, historian Betsy Peace. At the end of July, we have a program with his uh, with author Clint Smith talking about his new book, How the Word Is Passed, um, which is exploring. Uh, slavery in America, particularly the oral histories that were done by the Federal Writers Project during uh, the WPA period. And you guys should book tickets and come in and check out Brother Can You Spare a Dime? It's an amazing exhibit that explores the WPA through the lens of work and labor. Um, thank you all for joining us. If you'd like to make a donation, we appreciate it. Um, also, if you're a member, thank you for your membership. If you're not, feel free to join. Have a wonderful afternoon.